I believe with all of my heart and being that every man, woman, child, person, grandparent, everybody should infuse their days with habits of celebration and self-confidence. And the fastest and easiest and most science-backed way to quickly start to change how you see yourself is by adopting a simple habit of high-fiving your reflection in the mirror every single morning. Now, I know exactly what you're thinking. Are you serious, Mel Robbins? That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I know, I know, I know it sounds dumb. But the reason why your first instinct when you think about waking up, whether you're in your robe or your underwear, or your PJs or your birthday suit and walking into that bathroom and having a moment with yourself and raising your hand and high-fiving yourself is because your self-confidence is in the gutter. You believe some garbage about yourself. You think you're a bad person or you're unworthy or you're ugly or nobody likes you or how about this one? This was the story of my life. I have f***ed up my life so badly I might as well just flush it down the toilet. You have some narrative in your mind that is so negative that when you look in the mirror, you see somebody worth trashing. You see what's wrong. You pick apart your appearance. And I wanna reverse that because here's the deal about self-confidence. Self-confidence begins with you. You realize the word self is in there, right? I can't give you confidence. I can give you a little boost. I can give you tools, I can encourage you, but confidence is forged in fire. It's something that's within you. And here's the thing I want you to realize about confidence. You are a confident person. That's why you miss feeling that way. You can only miss what you know. You've just been blocked from the feeling of it. And wherever you are right now in your life, I'm telling you, confidence is in there. You just got to figure out how to tap into it. And you've been building confidence all along, by the way. Every time that you have fallen on your face or you've tried something and failed or you've gone out and thought you found the love of your life and then your heart's broken and then you pick yourself up again and then you dust yourself, you're building confidence the entire time because confidence is not built on the high days. Confidence is built on the low ones. Confidence is built when you are struggling. Because when you see yourself go for something and fall, when you see yourself try and get knocked down, when you see yourself stand back up after getting abused or traumatized or discriminated against and moving ahead, you are building this reserve within yourself where you know you can rely on yourself. You know you can face hard things and you can keep moving forward. You know you have your own back. So it's in there. Your life has been helping you build it. Now you got to just dig in and tap into it and use it to shut that critic up in your head. So the way you're going to do that is every morning, I'm not kidding, you're going to raise your hand in the mirror and high five yourself. Look at how many people are doing this. You're not the only one. For five mornings in a row, I want you to high five yourself. And when you do this, I want you to use the hashtag high five challenge. You know what's happening when you raise your hand up in the mirror? You are taking the lifetime positive association that you have with cheering for other people, believing in other people, uh, celebrating other people, saying, let's go to other people. And you are marrying that positive association with your reflection. It is impossible to raise your hand in the mirror and go, I suck. You can't do it because your brain and the subconscious sees this and thinks, let's go, I love you, I believe in you. And when you do this every single morning, something incredible happens. First of all, you're not gonna leave your bathroom feeling like you're dragging a boulder. You're gonna leave there feeling like the wind's at your back. Secondly, you're gonna have spent the morning, the first thing in the morning by taking a moment and being with yourself and not seeing your face and picking yourself apart, but actually seeing the person that's underneath the skin, the soul that's behind the face. You are going to shut the critic up. You're gonna silence your to-do list. And when you raise your hand like this, it also prompts you to think about the game you're playing. So now you got a moment to be like, oh yeah, yay me, I'm still here. I can make today a good day. In fact, what game do I wanna play today? Just for me. 
So that's the first thing that you're gonna do. You're gonna high five yourself, take the high five challenge, which is high five yourself five days in a row in the mirror, take a photo of it, post it on your story, tag me so I can cheer for you and start to notice what happens. Something weird happens by day four, when you get out of bed, you're gonna have this weird feeling that you've never had. You're gonna feel like you're looking forward to seeing yourself in the mirror because something weird happens when you start to really be present with yourself. When you normally walk in the bathroom and you ignore yourself, you're alone. And I think a lot of us feel like we're alone in our lives. When you start to see yourself, you literally, oh, hey, hi there, Mel Robbins. How you doing? You now, as you look forward, oh, hey, girl, how you doing? Hi, Mel Robbins. Oh, hey, let's go. I believe in you. Gonna have a great day. It's almost like when your neighbor waves to you, you're seeing yourself. You know, now that I've been doing this for a year, I don't feel like I'm alone. I feel like I've got myself and I've got my own back. I feel like this person that I see in the mirror is the one person that's gonna be with me for my entire life. So I better cheer for her. I better celebrate her. I better encourage her and love her. And that's what you're doing when you do this every morning to yourself. And there are mornings where I stand in my underwear at my bathroom sink and even I don't have a word to say to myself, but I can always do this and it always lifts my mood. And it is creating that deep connection within me to myself. And that's what builds your confidence. Confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. Confidence is knowing that you have your own back. Confidence is knowing that you can face something. Confidence is believing in your ability to face or survive or try something and be better. And confidence is being willing to try. And all of those things happen when you raise your hand every single morning. The second thing that you should do is, um, you gotta be honest with yourself. If there are things about your appearance that are within your control, whether it is the shape that you're in, whether it's the health choices that you're making, whether it's how you take care of yourself in terms of self-love, and you're not taking action in those areas, the lack of action says to your brain, you don't care about yourself. And so what I want you to do is pick one thing, one behavior that you could do every day. The high five's one of them, pick another one. And I want you to practice doing it. And it's a behavior. If you think about the person that you want to become, what's that person do every day that you don't do right now? And when you start to do the thing that the person you want to become is doing, you leverage something called behavioral activation therapy. And that is a whole body of research that says when you act like the person you want to become, it's the most powerful way to change a habit. It's even uh, better therapy than uh, talk therapy because the action proves to your brain that you're becoming that person. You're seeing the change through the action. And so then the brain catches up and starts to relate to you like a person that's confident or a person who adores their appearance or a person that celebrates themselves exactly as they are. So try those two things. Make sure you tag me online when you do the high five challenge. And uh, I know it's going to work. When life suddenly changes and you feel like you have lost control and you start to feel stuck and powerless, how do you take control when you don't know where your life or the world or this moment is going? And here's the number one thing I want you to know. You don't need to know where this moment or where the world is going. You just need to know where you are going next. And one of the things that has happened, uh, certainly in the pandemic, but it always happens when there's any kind of reckoning in your life, is that when you have something suddenly happen and your life is fundamentally changed, whether it's a death or somebody says, I don't love you anymore, or you're fired, or you find yourself uh, with a scary health diagnosis, there is a line in the sand. There is a life before that happened and then a life after that moment happened. And that line in the sand, that reckoning that happens, and it happens for all of us, whether it's happening for you right now or it has happened in the past, I'm telling you, 
there is a gift inside of this, even the darkest moments, because every single sudden change in your life that makes you feel like you've lost control and you no longer know where you're going, it's like hitting the giant pause button. And if you lean into the moment, there is a chance for tremendous wisdom and growth. There are things that you can do right now in order to take control of where you're going, of what you're thinking about. And you can start to take this moment of change and you can use it to be able to take and make an intentional pivot in the direction that is meant for you next. And one of the things I wanna say about this moment is look, if you're losing loved ones, you are terrified, this has made you lose your job, you feel like you're in that moment where everything, you know, you're falling off a cliff, you're trying to pack a parachute, you're grieving. And so you gotta give yourself space to grieve the losses that you're feeling. And when you get a little bit of distance from the grieving and the ways of grief and fear that you're feeling start to space out. They don't ever leave you, but over time, those waves of, holy cow, and I don't want this, and I can't handle this, and why is this happening to me? Time will start to lessen those waves. You will gather your feet underneath you again, and you will absolutely be stronger and be a better version of yourself based on this incredible challenge that you're facing. And I can say that even though you may be facing in a tough time, because if you think about your life, you faced extraordinary challenges and there hasn't been a single one that hasn't made you a better and stronger version of yourself. And this moment will be no different. So I want you to understand that when you get out of the cycle of grief, this is an enormous reckoning, an enormous opportunity for you to hit the pause button and for you to start to ask yourself the question, what do I want my life to look like? Because I think too many of us are sitting here going, I can't wait for my life to get back to normal. I can't wait for this to end. I can't wait to things to go back to normal. And in any moment of reckoning, what happens is there's actually parts of your old life that you don't wanna go back to. And there is a tremendous amount that you're learning in this moment that you need to pause and take in and say, okay, based on what I've just learned, based on my old life, when I look ahead to my new life, what is it that I want my new life to look like? This next chapter, I can turn to a blank page, I can take all this wisdom, all this resilience, all this strength, and I can write something new. That's what I want you to know. You don't need to know where the world or where everything is headed, you just need to know where you're gonna head next. So first of all, I literally have struggled with anxiety my entire life. And anxiety for this conversation, the way I define it, is it is the habit of worrying mm. spiraled out of control. You know, you may say that you are a worrier. That's not true. You have a habit of worrying. A habit is a pattern of behavior or thinking that you repeat without realizing it. So anxiety happens when that pattern of worrying about things spirals out of control and now it starts to marry and manifest itself with physical sensations too. Mm -hmm. That's all that it is. I know that I say that's all that it is. <laughs> Me personally, I struggled with anxiety uh, I think my entire life. It became quite acute when I was in my late teens and early 20s. I became medicated in the middle of law school. I took Zoloft for two decades. When our first daughter was born, who is now 17, the postpartum depression and the cascading panic was so terrible that not only was I medicated and couldn't breastfeed, but I couldn't be left alone with her. Wow. So when I say you can cure yourself of anxiety, I don't say that lightly. Mm. Four years ago, after I had been using the five second rule to change my behavior, how I spoke to my husband, how I negotiate in business meetings, how I conduct sales, the kind of parent that I am, my health habits, my eating habits, curbing the drinking, um, I thought, I wonder if I can use this five, four, three, two, one thing to get control of my thought patterns. Mm. Not my behavior patterns, my thought patterns. Yes, you can. Wow. So we're gonna, we're gonna build this conversation because I wanna start with something we can all uh, relate to and that is how do you stop worrying and how do you stop listening to self-doubt? This is how you're gonna do it. So all day long, 
you're going to have moments where your thoughts drift. And I use that word on purpose because for me, there is a physical sensation when you start to use the five second rule and you start to wake up, mm. not only on time in the morning, but you wake up to your life and the opportunities in your life. There's your thoughts drift. Like you'll just be hanging out with your friends and then suddenly you're like, I'm not sure that that person likes me anymore. <laughs> you know, I haven't heard from my kids lately. I wonder if they're dead or, you know, oh, you know, is what check like you just start worrying about stuff. Mm. Why? Because it's a habit. Because when you're not paying attention, your brain shifts from you being a decision maker and paying attention to you just kind of spinning things on autopilot and one of your habits is worrying. The second you wake up and you notice Holy cow, I'm talking some negative garbage to myself right now. Mm. Five, four, three, two, one. You've just shifted the part of the brain that you're using. You've shifted from the basal ganglia, which is where your habit loops are spinning, and you've awakened your prefrontal cortex. You've also interrupted that pattern. Now what you're going to do, because your mind is actually ready to receive a different thought because of the counting, now you can put in an anchor thought. Like if you have a mantra, if you've got a vision about the way that your business is gonna turn out in five years, if you just have a thought that makes you really happy and proud, insert that. Now, why does this work? It works because of the counting. And I'm not kidding. We know, based on research, that positive thinking alone, not effective. In some instances, trying to force yourself to think positive can actually make the worries worse. Why? Well, the reason why is because it's really hard to just change the channel. What we have to do first is basically interrupt it and turn off the TV and then turn it back on with the prefrontal cortex awakened. So the counting is essential. And so you can start using this today. You catch yourself talking garbage to yourself, because we all know if I were to put a speaker on your head and broadcast it, you'd be sitting here in the audience, you'd be in an insane asylum, because the crap that you say to yourself is insane. And the problem is we listen to it. You'll be, you'll be in a sales meeting, and you'll be undermining yourself. They're not gonna buy, oh my gosh, I'm in trouble. You're not even present. Five, four, three, two, one, switch it back. Get back to that vision that you have about toasting your success or this customer being really happy or you being proud of yourself. Mm. Whatever that vision may be, you can control your thoughts. And this is not just us talking about it. This is a tool that you can use. So let's take it a step further. So worrying, if you let it go unchecked, what will happen is you will get used to worrying. You will get used to living in a state where you're slightly agitated all the time. Let me talk a little bit about agitation. So what we know based on research is that physically, in your body, so physiologically, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Let me say that again, because it is so important. In your body, being excited is the exact same thing as being afraid. Your body doesn't know the damn difference. Your heart oh, races, your, heart your really armpits really. sweat, you're like, you know, you may get tight in your throat. You may, your cheeks may get pink like I do when I get excited. The only difference between excitement and fear is what your brain says. And the problem is if you have a habit of worrying, guess what you're gonna tell yourself is going on? That you're, that you're like freaking out that you're not excited, that something must be wrong. Oh gosh, why would you say something's wrong? Because you got a habit of saying that all the time. Even as I became a, a speaker for a living or I'd be on CNN, when I first started doing it, I would be freaking out backstage. But even, even though, like, you know, just, a couple, just last week, he's standing backstage, about to go on, 8,000 people, heart races, armpit sweat, mm. you know, my hands get clammy. I'm not nervous though, not at all, I'm excited. And so I developed this technique and research uh, out of Harvard, not based on my technique, but something very similar, proves that if you basically, right before you're about to do something, take a test, run a race, public speaking, a business negotiation, ask somebody to marry you, whatever it may be that gets your heart racing, just do this. Go, I'm excited. I'm excited to give that speech. I'm excited to ask him or her. I'm excited to do this race. I'm excited. Because what happens is you give your brain context so your brain doesn't escalate the stuff going on mm. in your body. Your brain's not worried. Make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can combine this with the five second rule. 
So we know how to do worrying. You, ca you catch your thoughts drift, five, four, three, two, one, anchor thought. If you start to feel your heart racing, five, four, three, two, one, to awaken the prefrontal cortex and then start going, I'm really excited to do this. I'm really excited to do this. Another technique that you can use is ask, um, I think they call it interrog interrogatory questions, mm -hmm. where instead of giving yourself a pep talk, say, well, why am I ready to do this? Why am I ready? Because that'll force you to answer the question, which then convinces you. Mm -hmm. So why am I ready to close the sale? Why am I ready to give this speech? Why am I ready? So those are two strategies that you can use backed by science that are proven to actually make your performance be much better. Now let's take it a step further to anxiety. So anxiety is what happens when the habit of worrying spins out of control, your body gets really agitated, and then you allow your mind to escalate it mm. into a full-blown panic attack. So for those of you that have not had the pleasure of having a panic attack, <laughs> Let me um, explain what it's like. So have you ever been in your car and you're driving down the road and you go to change lanes and all of a sudden there's like, oh my God, there's a car right there, yeah. right? And you swerve a little bit and then your heart's like, Brrr! and you may sweat a little bit and, and you grip the wheel really tight and you're super locked in on, on the road ahead of you. Mm. But then that car pulls away and the, the, the near miss scenario passes and your mind starts going, okay, you're all right now. Right. You're all right now. That's it. That's all, that's what a panic attack is, only it happens while you're standing in front of your coffee pot. <laughs> Seriously, you have that same, oh my God, what am I doing? And your heart's racing and, and the problem for your brain is that your brain can't look around and say, holy cow, we almost got hit by a car. Right. Your brain's saying, what the hell is wrong with her? She's making coffee and she's freaking out. And so now your brain has a problem because what's your brain's job? It's designed to protect you. Mm. So your brain will now do whatever it can to magnify the problem. Remember we talked about the spotlight effect? It'll start telling you all kinds of crazy stuff because it can't figure out contextually what the hell's going on. She's just making coffee, now her heart is racing and she's breathing really. Holy cow, maybe she is having a heart attack. Mm. A lot of people that have panic attacks say, I think I'm dying, oh my God, what's, what's happening? Wow. Or you'll see them do the deer in the headlights thing where they gotta get out of the room. That is the spotlight effect in your brain, now taking control and magnifying everything to get you out of whatever it was. So here's how you use the five second rule. You use it to stabilize your thoughts before the panic escalates. And then what happens is it drifts into worry and then it disappears. Right. So the second you feel worry, you catch it, you train yourself to do that. If you start feeling yourself getting, you know, your heart racing, you can five, four, three, two, one and use the I'm excited, I'm excited. Um, if you, if that doesn't work, literally five, four, three, two, one, and just give yourself an anchor thought, literally, of you being okay. Confidence is a skill that you can build using simple, repetitive tasks and thinking tools, and you can start building it today. I want you to just settle in for a second ground yourself in this moment. And I want you to think about what is something that you want to make happen this year in your life? What is the one thing that if, if Mel Robbins could wave her sparkly lip gloss and I could give you the next level of confidence, okay? What is that thing that you really want to create in your life? for real. And write it down. I see write a book. I see retire. I see uh, have 10 to 15 coaching clients, be a speaker, sell my art. All of it is achievable. How do I know that? Because somebody else in the world is doing it. If someone else in the world is doing what you dream of doing, you have evidence that it is possible for you. And here's what I know about your dreams. Your dreams are deeply personal. And when you have dreams that are deeply personal, that are meant for you, that pull you like an arrow is pulled towards a target, you only have two choices. You either got to figure out how to level up your confidence and start working toward it, or those dreams will haunt you. Because 
I personally believe, I'm writing a book about this right now, that when you're born, your dreams are woven into your DNA. They're preset. There is a life that is meant for you. And your dreams are trying to pull you toward this. And what's super, super cool about getting in touch with your dreams when it relates to confidence is that, you know, your dreams are just things that you can achieve if you work toward them. And so if you're not working toward your dreams, if you don't have your dreams already achieved, here's what I know. There's something about you that is blocked right now. And that's okay. Thinking about your dreams will haunt you. Getting out of the thinking habit and into the action habit, that is what will change your life. And so here's the next thing I wanna do. I want you to now level up even more because I bet the way that you wrote your dreams down, I bet you even shrunk it a little. I bet your self-doubt and your insecurity made you write a dream that was a little bit smaller than what you actually want, right? I know this because I do the same damn thing to myself. Of course I do. You know, I, I, I think about, you know, what my big dreams are and I go, oh, well, you know, what do I really want? I want my next book to be a massive success. I want it to dominate the bestseller list for at least 10 weeks. That's my big, big, big dream. But what I say is, oh, I'd love to, you know, make the New York Times bestseller list. I shrink it because my self-doubt and my insecurity even starts to block me when I dream. You feel the pull of your dream, but then you say this to yourself, it will never happen for me. There's a relationship between confidence, which pushes you forward, and self-doubt, which blocks you. And this is why self-doubt is such a killer, because you know what you want. You can feel what you want. You are jealous of people that have it. You are pulled toward that thing that you want. And your doubt is blocking you by actively convincing you it won't happen for you. So let's talk a little bit about confidence, okay? First of all, I've already said it's a skill. It doesn't matter if you were born the most insecure, thumb-sucking, abused, pathetic soul of a human being. You can build the skill of confidence. It doesn't matter if you came out of the womb super ego-driven and larger than life and confident and all that stuff. You still have a lot of work to do when it comes to confidence, authentic confidence. So let me talk to you about what is the skill of confidence. My definition of confidence is not belief in self. I love evidence-based advice because I'm kind of skeptical. I looked at the research on confidence, okay? And there's really good news here. The first thing you've already learned, it's a skill. The second thing that you are gonna learn that's really good is it's, it's very simple to build the skill of confidence. And you can do it through repetitive actions every day, very simple little things that will slowly build up the reservoir of confidence. And here's the definition I wanna give you of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. That's it. And the reason why I like this definition is because this definition is based in the research around confidence. So if you want to learn more about this, Google confidence competency loop. This is my fancy little graphic, okay? This is what we call a confidence competency loop. I did not invent this. This is something that people who research confidence for a living have created. And I've highlighted this because this is where confidence begins. It begins with the willingness to try, because I'm going to show you what ends up happening if you're the kind of person who trains yourself. Notice the words I'm using, trains. We're not going to sit around and wait for motivation. We're not going to wait for courage. We're going to manufacture those things. And this is where the five second rule is so transformative. All you do is in a moment where you feel doubt, insecurity, fear, anxiety, procrastination, perfectionism, PTSD, OCD, anything that you might possibly 
have that would rise up to block you, you simply count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, okay? And you gotta count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And what that will do is it will shift gears in your mind. Instead of being stuck here in the part of the brain that keeps you stuck worrying and thinking and having a bias towards overthinking and being a perfectionist, you're gonna go one, four, or five, four, three, two, one, and you're gonna try. The first time you try, you will fail. That's really good news. You wanna know why? You learn by failing. Do you realize that's how you've always learned? That when you were a kid, you don't remember this, but when you were learning to walk, you fell an average of 17 times an hour. And so you learn everything when you fail. Because when you fail, as much as you may think you're gonna die, if you stand on a stage, I see a lot of you who want to be coaches or speakers or whatever, you're going to have to learn how to give a speech where you stutter and where your, your mouth gets really dry and pasty and where you get a neck rash and where you forget what you're supposed to say. You got to do all that stuff. Why? Because when you fail, you don't die. You actually gain knowledge and experience. And that's the gift of failure because you then take that knowledge and that experience and you go right back to the next time. And then you try again. But this time when you five, four, three, two, one, try, you're gonna take your knowledge and experience with you and you're gonna fail a little bit less. And what you're gonna learn there, you're gonna take right back to the next time that you try. You five, four, three, two, one, you push yourself to try you gain a little bit of competency for the next time you're gonna do it. And every time you gain a little bit of competency, your mastery goes up. And that's when you start to feel more self-assured. And that muscle, everybody, of trying, that is where you build the skill of confidence. So let's talk a little bit about confidence, okay? First of all, I've already said it's a skill. It doesn't matter if you were born the most insecure, thumb-sucking, abused, pathetic soul of a human being. You can build the skill of confidence. It doesn't matter if you came out of the womb super ego-driven and larger than life and confident and all that stuff. You still have a lot of work to do when it comes to confidence, authentic confidence. So let me talk to you about what is the skill of confidence. Okay, you ready? My definition of confidence is not belief in self. What you're going to learn about Mel Robbins is that I love evidence-based advice because I'm kind of skeptical. You know, I was trained as a lawyer. Life has kicked me up, kicked me around a little bit. I kind of cross my eyes at people that are very kind of motivational. And, you know, I'm like, well, it's easy to do the inspirational stuff, but what's the depth, right? What's the depth? And so when I think about confidence and my definition of confidence, I looked at the research on confidence, okay? And there's really good news here. The first thing you've already learned, it's a skill. The second thing that you are gonna learn that's really good is it's, it's very simple to build the skill of confidence and you can do it through repetitive actions every day, very simple little things that will slowly build up the reservoir of confidence. And here's the definition I wanna give you of confidence. Confidence is the willingness to try. That's it. I'm gonna say it again, confidence is the willingness to try. That's it. That's all that it is. And the reason why I like this definition is because this definition that I have created for confidence, which is the willingness to try, is based in the research around confidence. So if you wanna learn more about this, Google confidence competency loop. Okay, I'm gonna show it to you. I'm hoping that, that this is not broadcasting backwards, okay? This is my fancy little graphic, okay? 
This is what we call a confidence competency loop. I did not invent this. This is something that people who research confidence for a living have created. And I've highlighted this because this is where confidence begins. It begins with the willingness to try, because I'm going to show you what ends up happening if you're the kind of person who trains yourself. Notice the words I'm using, trains. We're not going to sit around and wait for motivation. We're not going to wait for courage. We're going to manufacture those things. And this is where the five second rule is so transformative. Now, for those of you that don't know it, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time explaining it. I'm gonna give, it, give you the shortcut. It's just a simple brain hack backed by tremendous evidence that I created at the worst moment of my life that turns out to have extraordinary science behind it. All you do is in a moment where you feel doubt, insecurity, fear, anxiety, procrastination, perfectionism, PTSD, OCD, anything that you might possibly have that would rise up to block you, you simply count backwards, five, four, three, two, one, okay? And you gotta count backwards, five, four, three, two, one. And what that will do is it will shift gears in your mind. Instead of being stuck here in the part of the brain that keeps you stuck worrying and thinking and having a bias towards overthinking and being a perfectionist, you're gonna go one, four, or five, four, three, two, one, and you're gonna try. Now, this is what's gonna happen. The first time you try, you will fail. That's really good news. You want to know why? You learn by failing. You learn by failing. Do you realize that's how you've always learned? That when you were a kid, you don't remember this, but when you were learning to walk, you fell an average of 17 times an hour. You actually learned to walk by falling. And so you learn everything when you fail. Because when you fail, as much as you may think you're gonna die, if you stand on a stage, I see a lot of you who wanna be coaches or speakers or whatever, you're gonna have to learn how to give a speech where you stutter and where your, your mouth gets really dry and pasty and where you get a neck rash and where you forget what you're supposed to say. You gotta do all that stuff, why? Because when you fail, you don't die you actually gain knowledge and experience. And that's the gift of failure because you then take that knowledge and that experience and you go right back to the next time. And then you try again. But this time when you five, four, three, two, one, try, you're gonna take your knowledge and experience with you and you're gonna fail a little bit less. And what you're gonna learn there, you're gonna take right back to the next time that you try. And every time that you fail, you're gaining knowledge and experience. And you take that to the next time that you try. And you're going to go like this. And you're going to go like this. And you're going to keep going and going and going and going and going. And every time you five, four, three, two, one, you push yourself to try. You gain a little bit of competency for the next time you're going to do it. And every time you gain a little bit of competency, your mastery goes up. And that's when you start to feel more self-assured. And that muscle, everybody, of trying, that is where you build the skill of confidence, which is the willingness to not be so damn serious and hung up on being perfect and being worried about looking stupid. And instead, you're willing to lean in and try something. And what ends up happening, because so many people have a definition around confidence, it's about belief in self or self-awareness and all this kind of stuff. And that's great, but I don't prefer those definitions because then you're sitting around waiting to feel ready. You're sitting around and in those moments where you don't believe in yourself, you feel like you don't have a reservoir of confidence to draw on. And it couldn't be further from the truth. You were born with natural intelligence and confidence. How do I know that? I know it because it's part of the design of a human being. Think about what you were like as a child before the world got their hands on you. You just let whatever you were interested in pull you forward. 
you would crawl towards or tumble toward anything that you were interested in. You'd try anything. You'd crawl up to a mirror and stick your hands on it and lick the thing you loved yourself so much. But life got its meaty hands on you and started telling you no. Do you know the average kid hears some version of the word no, some redirection almost 400 times a day? So you became cautious. You started holding yourself back. You started thinking before you tried things. You started worrying about feelings. This is where it all begins. But you were born knowing how to do this. And the other reason why I know this is true is because you wouldn't know what it felt like. You wouldn't miss it if you hadn't once felt it. You wouldn't know any different. So I want you to know it's in you. And we got to just remove the block that life put in place and teach you that even in those moments where you doubt yourself, even in those moments where you're afraid, even in those moments where you're insecure, you can try. And it's in the skill of trying that you gain the competency, the knowledge, and the expertise that helps you become better and better and better. Because here's the trick. You know, the more experienced you become in something and the more you master it, the less stressed out and anxious and worried you are about doing it. That's how that sort of belief in self comes. The belief doesn't come first. It's a byproduct of you pushing yourself to try. So let me unpack some other things that I wanted to talk about quickly before we get into the Q&A. I promised to talk about self-doubt. And I want to I wanna talk about the difference between self-doubt, which is one block, and people-pleasing. Um, you know, I should probably share with you sort of this whole story about um, the way that I think about blocks, OK? So, uh, you know, again, I'm working on this book about this. And the other day, um, this was this fall, I went out to Los Angeles to move my daughter into her off-campus apartment. And she's got this huge kind of laundry room in the basement. You know, have you ever been in a, a laundry room, like in a commercial space where they've got all the lines of dryers? And so I was washing her sheets like, you know, moms and dads do when they move their kids into their off-campus apartments. And it was the final load of the day. I go downstairs to the basement and I open up the dryer and I'm like, that's funny. The sheets aren't dry yet. And so I put in a bunch more quarters. I hit the button. I leave. I go out the door and I hear, eh, and I'm like, that can't be my dryer. What? So I go back and the 30 minutes is still on the dryer. And I'm like, that's weird. So I open it up. They're damp. And it smells kind of like hot metal. And uh, I see the filter and I think, oh, I wonder if the filter's jammed. You know how like a dryer doesn't really work when the filter is filled? So I like try to open it and this sucker is really jammed. So luckily two guys walk in with a basket of laundry and I get one of them to like help me. And it's so jammed. He has to put his like foot up on the thing and like yank it out. And when he yanks it out, like, like literally it was like a lint carnival. I don't think anyone of the kids that live in that building had ever pulled that freaking filter out of that dryer. There was a disgusting stack of lint, like this freaking big, you guys. It was like gray and blue and black and red. And like, it was like artifacts. I, it was like an archeologist of laundry lint. I'm like, ah, oh, it's disgusting. So I like pull that thing off. And then the janitor walks in and he's like, ah, these damn kids. And this is gonna start a fire. And so we clean it off and he puts the filter back in and he turns to me and he says, um, you know, lint builds up. It's little, but it builds up and it blocks the flow of air. And, you know, it, it gets so hot in that dryer, the whole place could burn down. I seen it happen. And then he goes, but now that it's clear, the dryer can do what it's designed to do. And it gave me the biggest aha. And this is what I'm writing this book about. There is a filter in your mind called the RAS. It's called the reticular activity system. I like to call it the red Acura spotter because the way that this filter works, think about it, it's like a giant hairnet on your head, okay? The way that this filter works is that it blocks out things that it thinks is not important to you and it only lets in like 1% of what's going on in the world. 
And here's the interesting thing. It can be programmed. It's very nimble. If you've ever gone out to buy a car, have you ever noticed that all of a sudden you go into the dealership, you're like, oh, I like that red Acura. And then the next day, what do you see everywhere? You see red Acuras because your RAS, the hairnet on your brain, the filter that, that, that influences absolutely everything that you think and do. By you going to shop for a car, it has gone, oh, ding, 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 hold on. Mel Robbins is interested in red Acuras. Let them in, let the red Acuras in. And all of a sudden, every red Acura is now getting in through the hairnet in your brain. Okay, so this is good news because if you decide that that dream that is meant for you is something that you want, you can program that sucker to let in information that is related to it. And suddenly it becomes so easy to spot opportunities and easy to gain momentum and easy to try. Here's the problem. You ready? Your freaking filter is trapped with mental lint. That's right. You want to know what lint stands for? Because I'm a freaking genius. Lint stands for those moments when you lose inspiration due to negative thoughts. Thank you, everybody. I know I'm a genius. You can read all about it this fall. So you've got a filter that could help you make everything happen. But you want to know what? You've got this layer of crap in your brain just like that dryer vent had a layer of lint in it because nobody had changed the filter. You cannot do a load of laundry, people, without creating lint. And you cannot go through a day in your life without having some sort of negative mental lint build up. You have a lifetime of lint that is clogging the filter in your brain. I know it. I can teach you how to remove it and it's impacting your willingness to try. And the two forms of Lent, there are five of them, but I'm gonna talk about two of them right now. The first one is doubt. And doubt is the kind of moment when you lose inspiration due to the negative thought, it'll never happen for me. You wanna know why Mel Robbins has never done a live event, ever. I've never done any kind of live event on my own. You want to know why? Because I've got negative crap built up from childhood that makes me say no one will show up. True story. Tell me if you've been to an event in a stadium that I have produced. You haven't, right? Because I too have lint in there. And here's the great thing. Just like that dryer, when you realize you have a filter that needs to be checked and you've got a filter in your mind, that needs to be cleaned every day. Once you spot the lint, it's easy to go, oh my God, look at that bullshit, get that out of here. Come on now, please. Once you clear away the doubt, it will never happen for me. You can go, oh, look at that stupid lint. There it is again, it'll never happen for me. I don't think so, wipe that stuff away. Now you can use the definition of confidence. I'm willing to try. Whether it happens or not is irrelevant. I got to be willing to try. You know, I have this saying about confidence that I've only recently kind of stumbled into as I've been digging into more research around the science of confidence and the skill of confidence. Because a lot of people think that confidence is a personality trait. It's not. It's actually a skill that you build through action. And a lot of people think confidence is a state of belief. It can be, mm -hmm. but that's not where it begins. And so... I say that confidence is the willingness to try. That's all that it is. Hmm. Knowing that you may succeed or survive, but you'll still try. And to me, all those people that we admire most, that's what they're doing. They have the ability to tune into those instincts hmm. that are true for them. Because the fact is, there's only one you. That's it. And you matter because... There's only one you and there's only ever going to be one you and your instincts and your experiences and your inner wisdom is a gift to the world. And every time that you tune it out because of the habit of hesitating or the habit of self-doubt or the habit of worrying or the habit of overthinking, you are robbing the world of that gift that you have 
to, to give to everybody. Mm-hmm. And you can use this simple, stupid, silly tool to train yourself to not only hear it, but also to develop the skill of courage to act on it. Mm, powerful. And is there any area of your life where you feel like you lack courage still? Um, you know, I'll admit it's kind of easy. I think we all kind of go through those, those moments where you feel like you're behind. And I think social media is both an incredible tool and it can also be um, one of those triggers that makes you feel like, look at how many followers this guy <laughs> has. And like, I'm, I'm like so tiny compared to this guy right here. Like it's easy to right. use technology and social media not for inspiration, mm-hmm. but actually as a way to bash yourself that you're not doing what yeah, other people are doing. Yes. Yeah. And okay. so I think that I I use the rule a lot for patience. I notice that my insecurity rises up because right now, you know, look, I, I did a ridiculous number of speeches last year. I travel way too much. Mm. I don't want my life to look like that. Um, it's a champagne problem. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> but but I also have three kids in a marriage that I love and I really feel depleted when I'm not with them. And yeah. so I'm practicing patience as I make an intentional pivot in the kind of business that I'm running so that I have more of a life that I want as well. So that's one area. Um, You know, I I, I don't feel insecure as much as, you know, you know the term deliberate practice, right? Mm -hmm. And you know the five-hour rule where- Deliberate practice, is that from the talent code? Well, the deliberate practice is actually a psychological principle. I think it was in a book called The Talent Code, but yeah. Oh, yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a psychological principle that, you know, and you know the 10,000 hour rule. So, I mean, deliberate practice is in sports. Yes. Yeah, so, so, deliberate practice is this idea that, yeah, you could do 10,000 hours at anything and become an expert at it, but the way to do it faster is to uh, deliberate, to do deliberate practice, which yeah. means you're practicing with the intention of improving mm-hmm. and there's a feedback loop. Yeah. So, so 2,000 hours as opposed to 10,000. Correct. Right. Like for example, if you want to become an expert at guitar, <clears throat> learn scales. Don't right. just sit there for 10,000 hours and play the same song. Right. If you learn scales, you get the finger dexterity and the muscle memory yeah. and the scales neural pathway hard, development. By the way. Yes, so I saw hard. your guitar over there. So hard. <laughs> I saw your guitar. You know, I always wanted to play guitar, but instead I forced my three children to learn. That's good. You, go. you can just enjoy it. You just <laughs> yeah, watch them. Exactly. My brother is, uh, you know, the number one jazz violinist in the world. What? Yeah. And so I grew up watching the most incredible, like... Now, is he built like you, too? He used to be even, like, more jacked. They used to call him the Incredible Hulk of violin because he was just, like... Wow, snap the jacked. thing in half. Is yeah, he, 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 he would. Playing. He would, like, slam it like Jimi Hendrix style, yeah. Uh, but now he's leaned up a bunch actually. And so he's, yeah, he's incredible. So I used to just be all awestruck by his gifts and it was unbelievable, his skill. And so I learned guitar. I taught myself when I was 18, just cause I was like, I have to know something, you know, in terms That's of music, cool. I can barely, you know, I'm like a hack, but yeah. you know, at least I can do something. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm, I'm kind of in this mode of, <clears throat> of improving myself. And I'll give you one more thing that I'm working yeah. on. So yeah. I kind of think about my life and th- my work in three buckets. So we got this bucket here, yep. we got this bucket and we got this bucket. And so when you think about your business or you think about your passion or you think about work, I think about, okay, what do I need to do in terms of how much time and what actions do I need to take in order to develop the skills so that I can perform the work? Mm-hmm. So there's the deliberate practice that goes into practicing your skill, skill and your comp- yep, yep, and your competency <clears throat> yep. mastery so that when it comes time to actually deliver the work, whether that's selling or standing on a stage or writing a book or talking to people or selling real estate or whatever it is that, that it may, that may be your passion deliver. This is the one I neglected last year, which this is? bucket is what are you doing to personally develop yourself? So that you are the most capable, fulfilled, and satisfied human being. So that when you show up to do your competency and your Mm -hmm. skills and the delivery, that you as the human being are able to do that. Yeah. And so I've been spending a lot more time consuming content, reading books, watching, you know, your incredible show and learning from other people. And I think that one of the th- traps that we entrepreneurs get into is we, I, I, I was feeling last year anyway, like I was on a treadmill and when I wasn't looking, somebody was coming by and turning up the speed <laughs> sure. and I was only in this alley. And increasing the, uh, 
the the hills the, the bike <laughs> yes whatever the... yes and so and if you're my age you need like a diaper when somebody <laughs> does that and you're on a treadmill and a leash the to keep you attached yes. to it exactly so um i uh i've been focusing a lot on this and mm-hmm. it's been interesting because you and i were talking earlier too about you going to india and some of the mm-hmm. stuff that you learned in terms of the different yeah. states to be in and i use one where i pay attention to where i'm feeling depleted versus where i'm energized and mm-hmm. here's the thing you can be doing things that are really hard that energize you. You can be doing things that are really scary that energize you. The same is true with things that deplete you. There are things in your life that are really easy for you. There are people that you hang out with, by the way, that you've been hanging out with for years, mm-hmm. but they deplete you. And so I've been starting to become more deliberate about how I distance myself from things that deplete me And how I spend more time and energy either doing or pushing myself to do those things that actually energize me. And this gets back to your message around passion, right? Right. And that, you know, the, the art and the skill of building a life that is guided by the things that you're passionate about. Yeah. There was this one morning where, um, I walked into the bathroom and I was standing in my underwear, brushing my teeth in front of the mirror. And I looked up at the mirror and my first thought was, ugh. I noticed that my jowls were starting to look like saddlebags on a pack horse at the Grand Canyon. (laughs) And uh, I had like these crazy lines by my eyes and my neck was really like kind of saggy and one boob was hanging lower than the other and my gray hair was coming in and I, and as soon as I started kind of critiquing my thoughts or my, my looks and appearance, then my mind rich started going, fuck, I didn't get that email back to that person. And I got that presentation I need to do. And my God, did that speech just cancel again? What the f*** am I going to do? And I look down and the dog needs to be walked. And then I think I I got a zoom call in nine minutes. Like I got to get my shit. And before I knew it, my whole mood was low. I felt overwhelmed. I had taken myself down mentally. I just wanted somebody to walk in and be like, Mel, you got, it's going to be okay. Like you got this girl. Like mm-hmm. it's lift your head up. You can handle this. I don't know what came over me, Rich. This is pathetic. But standing there in my underwear in front of my bathroom sink, I raised my hand and high five my reflection. And I cracked a smile because it's so fucking corny. I even thought of that guy, Stuart Smiley from the SNL skit. Mm-hmm. So remember that I'm nice, I'm kind, yeah. people like me. Went on with my day. That was it. Snapped a photo though. No, not that one. Oh, not that one. Mm-mm. Not the first time. And then I kept doing it. I did it probably for a week or two. And here's the weird thing about it. I started when I woke up after doing this high five your own reflection in the mirror thing, I actually started to feel like I was looking forward to it. And here's why. You know, I've spent a lifetime just like you standing in front of the mirror. And what I realize now is that when I'm standing in front of a mirror, I'm either critiquing Mm -hmm. or picking myself apart or I'm ignoring myself. And when you start to high five your own reflection, it starts to build a partnership within you with yourself. When you walk into the bathroom and you see your reflection and you've been greeting it, it's like seeing another person. It's the strangest thing. You start to realize how often you fucking ignore or destroy yourself when you see yourself or beat yourself up. And here's what's also crazy. You have a lifetime positive association with high-fiving other people. Mm -hmm. Sure. As a runner, as a racer, You have gotten so many high fives, Rich. What does a high five say to you when somebody gives you one? You feel seen, you feel appreciated, you feel energized by it. And it's it's an exchange of energy. It's not the same, and you talk about this in the book, it's not the same as like self-talk because there's a participation involved in it. There's like a communion aspect to it. Yeah. And, you know, if you think about it, you're so good at celebrating, seeing, and cheering for other people in your life. 
You plan birthday parties. You reach out to people when you're worried about them. You help out colleagues. You cheer for your favorite sports teams. You high five people like Rich as they're running races past you. You buy people's merchandise. You do all kinds of stuff for other people. But nobody's taught you how to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. In fact, the reason why it feels f***ing weird to high five your own reflection is because you've been taught to do the opposite. Why is the default to just beat ourselves down like that? I mean, it is crazy. We would never treat anyone else in our lives, especially the people we care about, the way that we treat ourselves in terms of the self-talk or the narrative or the critique or the, you know, the, the, the kind of harshness with which we, you know, judge our appearances, our behavior, the way we, you know, think back on things that we said the other day and just are horrified by our own selves. And it's, I don't know if it's everybody, but everybody, it's most people, except for Buddhists. I mean, I yeah. think that they're like, like if you're a big practicing Buddhist, that's a monk, right? That's like just why kind can't of, the default be the good things, though? Well, you I know why yeah, is it wired you know that why? way? There's a there's cognitive bias. There's a there's a bias towards mm -hmm. negativity, uh, and it's a protection mechanism. That's a default from evolution. That if you remember the bad, sh you're more likely to spot it when it happens in right. the future, so you can avoid it. And here's where I think it begins. I believe my theory is that it begins two places. Either you, or that could be both actually, you either learned the pattern of beating yourself up because you had parents or caregivers that were hard on themselves or hard on you. And so as a child, you absorb that pattern and you now repeat it and you don't even realize it. So those moments you're like, oh my God, I sound just like my dad or my mom. That is an example of a pattern that you've absorbed. Mm -hmm. So particularly for women, We've watched our mothers be critical about their appearance. We've watched our mothers ignore and criticize themselves in the mirror. And so we learn that from our caregivers. So that's one place. The second place that we learn it is when the drive in your life becomes fitting in. Fitting into groups in elementary, middle, high school, college, your neighborhood, that feels safe when you fit in. When you feel like you don't belong, you immediately go into a protection mechanism. And I believe a lot of the negative self-talk is a sorting hat type of mentality yeah. that we do to ourselves going, I can't be with those people. I can't be with those people. It's safe to be with those people. And you start to see yourself and the world around you as places where you belong and places where you don't. And part of the criticism, as f***ed up as it sounds, that we engage in all the time is don't be too big, don't be too loud, don't show yourself too much, don't have blue hair, don't do this, other people won't like you. It starts as a way to protect yourself from mm -hmm. being rejected, but the truth is you develop a habit of f***ing rejecting yourself. Right. Meanwhile, you're further divorcing yourself from who you truly are because you're Correct. not giving yourself permission to be yourself that gets sublimated in favor of fitting in and you know, accommodating other people and acclimating your behavior around what will be approved of. Yes. So for me, um, I, you know, I have clearly a lifetime of beating myself up and tearing myself down and regretting decisions that I made and in the middle of stumbling through life, instead of being like, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay, being like, you're really fucked up now, Mel. How does that help? Right. How does criticizing and, and being hard on yourself help? You know, I've heard a lot of experts say that fear isn't real. That is such a bunch of baloney. Fear is so real. In fact, there are probably things that you're afraid of doing right now in your life, in your relationships, at work. And the fact that you're afraid that's robbing you of all of the experiences that you wanna have in your life. I mean, if you're afraid to fly, that's gonna limit your ability to travel and see the world or go visit friends. If you're afraid of public speaking, that's gonna really limit your ability to express yourself and share your ideas. If you're afraid of talking to your boss or asking for a raise, that directly impacts how much money you make. Or what if you are dreaming of starting a business or you've already started a new business, but you're afraid to talk to people and you're afraid to share your business with people? I mean, fear is something that stops us all. And that's why I'm here to talk to you because it doesn't have to. Fear is real, but I am gonna share a secret weapon that I have used for years to beat every single fear 
that used to stop me. Now, first, before we get into this secret weapon, I just want to cover a few facts about fear, what it is, what it isn't, and some things that you may not know about fear. So first thing, fear is a physical state in your body that is exactly the same as excitement. Let me say that again. Fear and excitement are the exact same physical state. Your heart races, you might sweat a little bit, you might feel tightening in your chest, you might feel a pit in your stomach, uh, you have a surge of cortisol. It's basically the way that your body goes into a hyper aware state because it's readying for action. Now, what's the difference between fear and excitement? Really simple. The only difference between fear and excitement is what your brain is doing as your body is all agitated. If you're excited, your brain's going, oh, wow, this is going to be so cool to ride this roller coaster. If you're afraid, your brain's going, oh, uh, uh, no way. There's no way I'm doing that. This is dangerous. Get out of there. Don't do that. It's saying something different. So what's critical about understanding this is that we're going to use the fact that your mind is either working for you for excitement or against you with fear to your advantage. And I'll tell you about it in just a minute, how you're going to do that. Second thing I want you to understand is that you may have heard the advice, feel the fear and do it anyway. You may have heard the advice, oh, just try to calm down. Think positive thoughts. It doesn't work, does it? And there's a reason why it doesn't work. So let's go back to fact number one. When you're afraid, your body's in a state of arousal and agitation and your heart is racing and you're all like amped up and you're hyper aware of what's going on and you're freaking out a little bit. What is it like when you're calm? <sighs> you just kind of chill, right? You got like this low arousal state. Very, very difficult to go from a state of agitation and being all jacked up and excited and weirded out and, uh, to a <sighs> kind of state. It doesn't work. It's like trying to stop a train by throwing a boulder on the tracks. It's going to make the train jump off the tracks. It's going to cause a disaster. In fact, they've proven in research that when you try to ignore your fears, it actually makes them worse. And they've also proven in research that positive thinking alone also can make your fears work worse. So what do you do? What do you do when you're about to go talk to your boss and you feel afraid? What do you do when you have to get on a plane and you're actually terrified of flying? What do you do if you got to give a presentation and you are afraid of public speaking? Here's what you're going to do. You're going to use a strategy, the same one that I use, that has helped me beat every single fear and turned me into somebody that is terrific when it comes to a high stress situation. This is how you do it. You're going to use my five second rule in combination with what I call an anchor thought. And that is going to reframe what your mind is doing so that your mind goes from feeling agitation and making you afraid to reframing it from agitation to excitement. It works like magic. Now I have used this technique for years, literally for years. And one of the ways that I want to introduce you to it is I want to take you backstage. I want to take you backstage to a speech that I delivered this year. And what you're going to see is you're going to see me behind, you know, the major set. I'm about to walk out. You can kind of hear the crowd roaring. My introductory video is playing. My body is in a state of arousal. I am literally, my heart is racing. My arms are sweating. Like it's like, you're going to see this. I'm going to tell you about it. And you're going to watch me use this same technique. I'm going to teach you to reframe my nerves into excitement. Check this out. All right, I'm about to go on stage. There are 7,000 people out there, and it's so exciting because what they don't know is they're about to learn the five second rule, and their lives will never be the same again. Now, I gotta tell you, my heart is racing. Um, my armpits are sweating. I have the exact same physiological feeling as when I'm afraid, but I'm not afraid. I'm excited. Excitement and fear is the exact same thing in your body. It's just what your brain calls it. Here's a trick that's proven by science that I use every time I speak. When I start to sweat, when I start to have butterflies, when I start to have my heart race, I say, I'm excited. I'm excited to get out there. 
I'm excited to talk to these people. I'm excited to share the five second rule. And what that does is it sends a message to my brain that tells my brain why my body's all agitated and excited. And that way, I don't feel afraid. Remember, excitement and fear, exact same thing in your body. The only difference is what your brain calls it. Go get them. Now, I wanna give you one more example, just to make sure that you really get how you can use this. So a lot of you have written to me about your fear of flying, and I can really relate to that fear because I used to have the exact same fear. But I use this same strategy to conquer it. Here's how you're going to do it. So first things first, if you've gotta do something that really makes you nervous or that you're afraid to do, before you're about to do it, come up with an anchor thought. What's an anchor thought? Well, an anchor thought is something that's going to anchor you so that you don't escalate any situation into a full-blown panic attack or into a situation where you screw things up. It's a way for you to anchor yourself so you maintain control over what you're thinking and how you behave. So here's an example with flying. It's important when you're creating an anchor thought to pick something that is in the proper context of what you're afraid to do. So for flying, pick an anchor thought that has to do with the trip that you're taking. So if I'm boarding a plane to fly back home to Michigan, an anchor thought might be a picture in my mind of my mom and I walking on the shores of Lake Michigan where I grew up. That's a thought that makes me happy, it makes me excited, and it's also related to the trip that I'm taking. If you have a conversation that you need to have with your boss, pick an anchor thought about how you feel after having that conversation. Maybe it's you picking up the phone and calling somebody that you, you love and saying, oh my gosh, it went so well. Or you, know, you walking out of the meeting and feeling like, yeah, I survived that conversation. I feel pretty good about myself. So now that you have your anchor thought, you're ready to beat the fear. This is a great story about a bunch of topics. It's a story about confidence. It's a story about being comfortable in your own skin. It's a story about being yourself, no matter where you are or what you're doing. And it's a story about the power of your unique self-expression. And your unique self-expression comes out and is amplified when you feel comfortable in your own skin. I got into the speaking business, gosh, six or seven years ago. I had a TEDx talk that went crazy viral. That's what started the speaking business. And when I first got into the speaking business, I was really intimidated because I was new to it. And I wanted to do a very good job and I wanted to fit in. So I looked around at what all the top people in the industry of uh, motivational speaking and speaking on the corporate circuit were doing. And I noticed that all the women uh, were dressed in heels, wearing pencil skirts or beautiful dresses, the kind of thing that you might see a news anchor wearing, like a nice dress, heels. So I just wore what everybody else was wearing. Didn't even occur to me to wear something else because here I am trying to break into a new industry. So I look at everybody at the top, I copy what they're doing, and I am not comfortable in high heels. Yes, if my husband Chris and I are going out on date night, I can rock them like the best of them. But walking through a convention center in them, standing on a stage for an hour in a pair of heels while you're trying to hold in your stomach because you're being broadcast on a big screen and you're wearing a, a dress, like it was the least comfortable outfit I could possibly wear, very self-conscious in it. I'm not that graceful in a pair of heels. So I sort of like poof, poof, poof on a stage, but that's what I did for the first couple of years. So I was in Miami. This must've been probably five years ago. I was in Miami and I just gotten off stage, take off the heels, take off the dress, put on a pair of jeans and a t-shirt. I got like an hour to kill before I have to leave for the airport. I'm gonna to fly to Vegas because I've got a speech in Vegas the next morning. So I'm walking uh, down Collins Ave in South Beach in Miami. And I walk past this store. Unfortunately, it's not there anymore. I loved this store. And there in the window were the most amazing high top sneakers I had ever seen in my entire life. I was like a moth to the flame. Let me show you these bad boys because these are the originals. This right here, notice the gold shimmery sparkle and the confident blaze orange. I didn't own anything 
like this. I'd never seen anything like this. I immediately thought, whoa, this, I bet is what like a Justin Bieber kind of wears. I mean, these are insanely cool. I went inside and they were pretty expensive. I'd never spent that kind of money. I wasn't a sneaker head yet, but I thought, hey, I, I, I spend that kind of money on a pair of nice heels. So why not treat myself to a pair of sneakers, okay? So I get back to the hotel, I pack up, I hop the flight, I get to Vegas. Now I wake up the next morning and I have a tech check, which is where you rehearse the speech and go through like all the technology rehearsals before the event starting. My tech check is at 7.30, the doors to the event open at eight and I'm on stage at 8.30. And I had a red dress, my heels, or so I thought. So I crack open, that's what I was planning on wearing. I crack open the suitcase, there are no heels. I have left the heels in the hotel room back in Miami. All I have are the Birkenstocks that I wore on the plane and I wore out in Vegas last night and my new Justin Bieber high top sneakers. And I have exactly 15 minutes to get to the tech rehearsal and nothing else is open. So Birkenstocks, Justin Bieber, I think we'll go with the Justin Bieber sparkly high tops. I slapped those puppies on. I walked from my hotel room all the way through the casino floor, past all the restaurants and the shops to the convention center, which you know is like a two mile walk. I was so happy to be not only in my red dress, but more importantly, in my Justin Bieber sneakers because it was super comfortable to walk there that way. I get to the backstage area and for the first time in two years, something happened. And let me tell you what happened. One of the guys that was on the production crew turned and goes, ah, oh, cool sneakers. That was like the first time somebody in production had really acknowledged me for something other than the job in two years. So I was like, huh. And as I started walking toward the backstage area, everybody I passed, cool kicks. Oh, those are cool. Oh, those are cool. And I'm like, this is wild. Nobody's ever complimented on my, like this is like, people are. And so I did the tech rehearsal and then this was the moment of truth. When I walked out onto that stage, it was at the MGM Arena, and uh, there were like 5,000 real estate agents in the audience. I was there to deliver a speech for Remax. It was the first time I'd ever walked on a stage where I actually felt like myself. It was also the first time that I felt the audience kind of lean forward and go, oh, she seems kind of cool. But when you walk onto a stage in heels and a dress, you're like, the authority and you're on a stage and you're talking at people. There's something about walking onto a stage or walking through life and having something fun that you're wearing that makes you relatable and interesting and real. And from that moment forward, I have never not worn sparkly sneakers for work. I wore them every day on my daytime talk show. I'm embarrassed to tell you that I probably have 20 pairs of these. I love, this is my favorite, these are my favorite. Well, I love, these are my favorite because these are the originals, but I would say these are my second favorite because I like the low top, top and I love the blue. I love these, um, which have a big silver kind of thing. These are super comfortable. And I've got a bunch of these and these did not even come with sparkles. So I literally bought Swarovski crystals or whatever the hell they're called and got a glue gun out and put them on myself. If you're looking for sparkly sneakers, there's all kinds of them out there these days. It's the coolest thing in the world. Bedazzled sneakers are a thing. Whether you go to DSW or Nordstrom's or Zappos or anywhere, you can find them. And so the moral of the story, the secret to confidence is being comfortable in your own skin. And the secret to being relatable and likable is being yourself and being comfortable in your own skin. And so whatever it is that gives you a little flair, whether it's a little pin on your jacket or a little flower in your pocket or sparkles on your sneakers or cool specs, you gotta like, you gotta, you gotta find the confidence to bring that to the way that you go through life because there's something unique about you. And when you settle into what is really an expression for you, you feel comfortable in your own skin. And that's the greatest feeling in the world. In this video, I'm gonna show you the specific way that you can use the five second rule to stop doubting yourself and worrying so much. Now, a lot of people will tell you, oh, 
just think positive or meh, try not to worry. It sounds simple, but it's not easy. And the reason why it's not easy is because it doesn't work. And actually research shows that when you try to ignore your worries, it can actually make them worse. Look, I understand this topic more than most people because I struggled for decades, not only with worrying and self-doubt, I actually suffered from anxiety and panic attacks for almost 25 years. And in fact, I took Zoloft for two decades to control my anxiety. Using the five second rule, I've not only been able to stop worrying and doubting myself, I've cured myself of anxiety and I've been off meds for more than four years. I'm panic attack free and I almost never ever worrying about anything. And you can teach yourself to do the exact same thing using the rule. First, here's what I want you to know. You're not a worrier. A lot of us call ourselves a worrier, right? Oh, I'm a worrier. You're not a worrier. You have a habit of worrying. That's a very big difference. You've allowed your mind to drift and linger on negative thoughts so many times it's now a pattern of behavior that you repeat and you don't even realize it. And that's actually good news because that means that you and I can use the science of habits to break the habit of worrying and the habit of doubting yourself. In the language of habit research, the five second rule is what psychologists call a starting ritual. It's, it's a tool that you can use that will interrupt the negative thought patterns that are encoded in your brain as habits and trigger positive new thought and behavior patterns. The five second rule is shockingly effective because it works with all the latest research about habits. What I've learned using the five second rule is that I do in fact have control over what I think. And when you use the five second rule, you'll discover that you do too. Here's how you're gonna use the rule. The moment, the moment that you feel your thoughts drift, and have you ever noticed how worrying and self-doubt, they have a way of literally like taking you away from a situation. You can feel your mind go from the present moment to drifting to something negative. Maybe you're sitting at a meeting at work and uh, suddenly you start talking down at yourself and doubting yourself. It happens like that. But the moment that you catch yourself do it, that's a moment of tremendous power. You have a decision to make. You can either sit there and listen to the worry and listen to the self-doubt and let it hijack you, or you can make a decision to assert control. That's when you use the rule. You're going to use the countdown trick, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. It's essential. Counting backwards interrupts the negative thought pattern. It's also going to awaken your prefrontal cortex, which is the part of the brain that you need to override a bad habit and replace your bad habit with a positive new one. So every time you feel your thoughts drift to something negative, or you find yourself worrying about things you can't control, five, four, three, two, one, it'll switch the gears in your brain, it'll interrupt the negative thought pattern, it'll activate your prefrontal cortex, and you've just created a starting ritual that will prime your mind to accept a more positive thought. That is how you use the rule to change. Some days you might use the rule 20 times to interrupt your habit of worrying and doubting yourself. I haven't lost anybody that I love. So I would not say what I'm about to say if somebody that I loved had died in this pandemic. But I have found the great pause that the last two months have forced me to take to be the greatest gift that I have received in the last decade. My kids have been home. I have been off the road. I have been forced to slow down. I have been reminded of what actually matters, your health, your family, your friends, what you're doing to take care of your mind and your body and your spirit, and making sure that you do something with the time that you have that you really, really enjoy. And the other thing that it's really made me stop and think about is making sure that I'm having fun, that my whole life isn't just work. And it's made me really start to think 
about the fact that I don't want to go back to the life that I was living before the pandemic hit. How many of you feel that way? That this has been a gigantic mental perspective switch reset button that has, boom, hit you really hard. I want to know in the comments, what is it that you, with this new perspective that the pandemic has given you, what is it that you want to change in your life coming out of this? I want to start seeing. I see people saying this has been a wake-up call. I see people saying, yes, this has been a huge shift in my perspective. I see Brianna saying, I want to travel less for work. What do you want? Kelly says she's had a mental switch. Kelly, what has this pandemic given you in terms of the gift? Heather's saying, I want to ask myself, what do I really want to do? Kim says, I don't want to go back to the rat race. Brock says, I want to start the year uh, excited about it. Uh, I see somebody saying, uh, Larissa says a new business. Uh, Megan says, I want more boundaries. Tara says, I want to have more fun. What is it that you want to change given the gift that this pandemic has given you in terms of shifting your perspective? Dinky says, value my friends and family. Uh, Jealous is take care of my mental health. Spend more time with family. What do you want to change, everybody? Seriously, what do you want to change about your life? Is it a relationship? Is it that you have had the time to take care of yourself in small ways and that's giving you greater control in your life? Do you want to change your job coming out of this? Do you want to launch a business coming out of this? Do you want to um, change uh, your timeline for achieving your goals? Is there some project that you want to take on? Because what you're going to hear me say over and over again is that the single most, impro most important project you could ever work on is yourself. And the greatest gift that any challenge will ever give you is a perspective shift and the realization that you can face hard things, that you can survive hard things, and that in learning more deeply about yourself and about what you value through the challenges in life, you are going to be handed a moment where you can make a decision you hear me say all the time, you're one decision away from a different life. Changing your life does not take motivation. Motivation is garbage. Changing your life takes discipline. The discipline to make a decision to change. You see, you need three things if you want to come out of this pandemic and truly change your life for the better. So many of you do not want to go back to the life that you were living. You see something greater for you. And what you're going to need in order to make that shift is you need clarity. You need the clarity to write the change down. And I want you to start right now. What in the comments? Let's get really clear. Terry wants to come out of this a healthier and better person. What is the clarity? Tell me the change that you want to make coming out of this. You've got to have the clarity to write it down. That's number one. The second thing that you got to have in order to make a change happen is you've got to learn the skill of confidence, which is the ability to try something when you don't feel ready. You may not know how to do this change. I see advocate for myself. I see more physical movement. I see I want to change my job. I want to start a business. I want to earn more money. I want to travel less. I want my work to have meaning. I want to get out of an abusive relationship. I want to help people in need. I want to make sure that I continue to keep the promises that I've been keeping, getting up on time, working out every day working on my relationship. This is fantastic because you're having a moment of clarity. And when you start to write it down, you are starting to develop the confidence 
and the knowing that you deserve to have this change happen. And then finally, what do you need in order to really change your life? Because it's not motivation, everybody. It's discipline. Discipline to make small promises, keep small promises, discipline to take small actions when you feel afraid, the discipline to find the courage to push yourself forward when you don't know how. That's how you change your life. Just those three things, clarity, confidence, courage. That's all you need. And that's why you got me in your life because I'm here to push you. I'm here to encourage you. And I love seeing what you wanna change. That, oh, I see you need help building confidence. No problem, I got you covered. Because confidence isn't something that you feel. Confidence is a skill. Confidence is the willingness to try. Because it's through the act of trying, through the act of simply writing down what's the change that you wanna make right there in the comments. Just writing it down and trying it out, trying out writing what that feels like, that's going to show you that you have the ability to start to express the things that you want. And that's the first step to claim these things that you think about. Um, so for those of you, more than a hundred of you who have written to me in the last week and who have said, I've had a huge perspective shift thanks to this pandemic. And there are some major changes I want to make in my life. I want to start a women's group. I want to end this relationship that I'm in. I want to stop bashing myself all the time. I want to launch that business I've been talking about. All of the things that you've put on hold. Now is the time to change. So many of you ask me, is it the right time to change your job after a pandemic like this? Absolutely. Because if you don't hear the clarity that's inside you, if you don't quiet the noise and tune in to hear, if your instincts, if your wisdom, if your knowing, if inside of you, you hear yourself saying, I got to get a new job. I got to get out of this relationship. I don't want to live where I live anymore. I want to be near the water. I want to be in the mountains. I want to be out of the city. I, you have to tune into that stuff. And then it's about confidence and courage to take action. That's it. I'm going to share with you a story about how I figured it out. And then I'm going to give you some advice about how you can think about it. And then I want to say a few other things about the fear of disappointing people. Because this is, I believe, the single biggest factor for most people that robs them of success. That you use what other people might say or think or be disappointed by as an excuse to not fully be yourself, to not fully go after what you want. And so first let me talk about triggers because I believe that for most of us, the habit, and I use the word habit because habit just means that it's a pattern. We have a pattern where we fear disappointing people and then that triggers us to operate in certain ways. That that pattern began a very long time ago. And I think it's safe to say that for 99% of us, you can find where it began somewhere in your childhood. And it probably doesn't matter that you find the first because you probably have 150 examples of being terrified that your dad was gonna scream at you or terrified that your mom was going to get cold and get that tone of voice or terrified that some Somebody was going to be upset with you like because the fear of disappointing people really has more to do about being in trouble with somebody right so for me I know the moment because it was a really defining moment for me but I didn't remember it until I was 27 what happened is I had a memory being in a, a group environment during a seminar somebody was sharing about being a sexual abuse survivor and she was talking about her sister and all of a sudden I had this memory triggered where I remembered being in the fourth grade and I remember being on a ski trip with my family and a couple other families and I remembered waking up in the middle of the night with an older kid on top of me. Now it wasn't a terrifying sexual abuse story. It was more confusing to remember it. He did what he did and then he got off of me and I remember my brother was sleeping in the bed next to me in the bunk bed.
head. And I remember thinking in that moment, oh my God, don't make a noise. I don't want this person to hurt Derek. So fast forward to the morning, all the kids leave to ski. I'm kind of like underneath the covers and I get out, I go downstairs. And as I go down the stairs, I hear my mom talking in the kitchen. And I think I gotta tell her, I gotta tell her, I gotta tell her, I gotta tell her. So I'm in fourth grade. I round the corner, my mother's there with another mom and there's the kid. And my mom goes, how'd you sleep? And I said, fine. And what's interesting is what? A fourth grader's brain. I mean, my mom's not gonna be upset with me. She might've gotten upset all right if I had said, not at me. There was this moment where I remember it now like that. And you don't have to come up with the moment because I guarantee you, you've got a hundred of them where you have a bad report card or you broke something or mom or dad drank and you heard them pull in and you felt the anxiety coming in and you went into a mode where you became quiet because you don't want to upset somebody. It was just this mode where I so knew in that moment that I needed a strategy to avoid a scene. Does that make sense? Because that's what you're doing when you are not disappointing people. You are avoiding making a scene or having them do one. Does that resonate a little bit? Okay, good. So you can go to the root cause because what I discovered in that moment in realizing, holy cow, at the age of nine, I made a decision not to tell the truth, that I would just make up what I thought would make the situation okay. And what's interesting is I can take that one decision and roll the clock forward until the age of literally like 27, probably took me longer to about like 35, 40 even, to stop lying. The fear of disappointment for me turned me into a liar and I didn't even realize it because I was so worried about creating a scene or upsetting people or having people judge me that I started lying as a strategy. I invented it as a fourth grader. It didn't work in my life. It made every relationship suck. It made me miserable, but that's what happened. So when you think about your pattern of being afraid of disappointing people, of managing not making a scene, you don't need to find the exact trigger when it began. If you find just one and you understand kind of how old were you and what did you feel and what were you trying to manage? And then for me, what I say to myself is, oh, well, I have a lot of empathy for myself now because I understand why I developed that strategy. And now that I saw that it was a strategy that worked, because lying really worked when I was little, not so much when I was an adult. When I understand it was a strategy, I can now say, oh, well, that's a strategy that worked then. Now that I'm in this chapter of my life, I'm gonna pick a different strategy. Does that help? So the fear of disappointing people, we've talked about one place that it comes from, which is making sure not to create a scene and making people like you. That's one lane that most of us have. And I'm gonna tell you a story in a minute about how you can manage this. The second lens, and I gotta give credit to my business partner, Mandy, for this, is that so many of us have this perfectionism gene. And the reason why we're perfectionists is we're trying to insulate ourselves from criticism. That if you get it perfect, no one will give you feedback. If you get it right, nobody's going to criticize you. If you do it perfect, then no one will be able to attack you. And the problem with that, and that's just another side of the same coin, which is the fear of disappointing people. You're managing not disappointing people, not by lying and not by being codependent, but by actually trying to be a perfectionist so that nobody criticizes you. So let me tell you a story about the fear of disappointing people in my own life because this is the biggest trigger in my life. I mean, it goes back to being in fourth grade, right? It's there. And this is another thing. I, I literally have to remind myself of this, everybody, every single day. You cannot remove the things that trigger you. You can't. If you've been doing a pattern since fourth grade, there will be things for the rest of your life that will trigger that pattern to come up. But you can always choose not to repeat the pattern. So you'll be triggered and be afraid that you're gonna disappoint somebody. That's real, that's normal, it's natural, it's part of being a human being. I think it's interwoven into every relationship where you love somebody. But you don't have to behave the way that you always behaved when you're nervous about disappointing somebody. So let me give you a dumb story, you ready? When my husband and I got married, my father gave us this really incredible gift. He gave us an antique pool table. I grew up in Muskegon, Michigan, where Brunswick was founded. 
and my dad has a hobby of going to garage sales and estate sales and buying old dilapidated pool tables and then he restores them. So when Chris and I got married, he bought us an old dilapidated pool table from the same era as our house, which is the 1870s. He restored the whole thing and then recently he and I rented a U-Haul and we drove this sucker from Muskegon, Michigan to Boston, Massachusetts. My dad and I took a road trip. We get there and we assemble the pool table in what used to be our playroom. Fast forward three or four years, the speaking business takes off, my business starts to grow, we have people that work for us, and my kids are older, we don't need a playroom, we need an office. The pool table is in the middle of this thing. For the first two years of having the office, we kept the pool table there. Why? Because I didn't want my dad to be disappointed, because I love him. Now, he visits our house twice a year for two or three days with my mom. And I kept this thing occupying a third of our office for two years. And then I realized I'm being ridiculous. I'm being absolutely ridiculous. Now here's the thing. Will he be disappointed if I take the pool table down? Absolutely, definitely. There are always going to be things that you do, decisions that you have to make in your life, in your business, for your family, that will disappoint other people. It's unavoidable. But the fact that he's going to be disappointed should never be the reason that I don't do something that is aligned with my values. Now, let's take it a step further. When you make a decision that is likely going to disappoint people, or that does, still make the decision, because it's your life. There's nothing worse than when you start to rob your future and your life and your happiness because you're so focused on other people. However, if you love people, you can still take care of them when you make that decision. So let me go back to the example of the pool table. So I knew I was gonna take it down. I knew my father was gonna be disappointed. I was disappointed. I don't have a big house. So I don't, you know, I don't have the room for a huge pool table. I don't have a finished basement like a lot of people. I don't have like a cool garage game room thing like I don't, I just don't have it. I called him first and said, I need to talk to you about something. You know the pool table, I love the pool table. Dad, my business is growing so much, I actually need an office. And, oh great, it'll be great in the office. And I'm like, well, <laughs> yeah it would, except I have you know, three or four people showing up and we gotta put some desks in there for now. Even went down, well you could put a piece of plywood, and they could work on the pool table, and then they could do the thing, and then the thing. And now my heart is racing, because I don't want to disappoint my dad, and now he's fighting for the, and I had to just say for me, dad, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to hire professional movers in the pool table business to disassemble this with love and care. We are going to store it beautifully. When I either get a full-time office off-site, or I build a barn, or I build a different house, this will have its own beautiful room dedicated to you. So we had this beautiful conversation. Now, was he disappointed? Absolutely. When they come to the house and visit, which they just did, and they walk into the office, do I feel a pang? You better believe I do. It doesn't matter. That's all normal. I still need to make the decisions that I need to make. And the difference, what's changed, is how I relate to that fear. So instead of what I would do in the past is, I would make a decision that doesn't serve me. I'd leave the pool table, and then I'd be all about it. I'd leave the pool table as a way to make my dad happy, but it makes me miserable to leave it there because I need the space, right? And then I'd be kind of annoyed, and then he'd come, and I'd fake play pool because I kind of want to rub, you know, you, know, you know what I'm saying? Like we do all this bull that's not real. And what I've been able to do for myself in some instances when I catch it is to hit it head on and to be authentic and to still take care of people. And what I've also come to learn is that people can be disappointed in you and they still love you. You know, you're never gonna get around this. Everybody in your family is gonna be disappointed with you, probably once a day, probably. And you have the ability to retrain how you respond to that trigger that rises up in you where you start to fear that you're disappointing somebody. And the answer really is make the decision that's aligned with your values and the thing that supports you, and then take care of the person by being honest and straightforward about it dealing with their disappointment head on, because that's really the adult thing to do, and that's what you do when you love somebody. The way we've all been handling it, myself included, is manipulation, lying, resentment, withholding, and that doesn't serve anybody.
Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for checking this video out. And if you like this one, I have a feeling you're going to like this one too. I'll see you there.